Vincent, how are you? Hey, Brian, how you doing? I'm doing well. Good. You can you hear me all right? Yeah, I got you. Can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Looking awesome. good. Um, people are, uh, we got some viewers already. As soon as I started the show, it's kind of like your race. People all of a sudden uh, are on there anticipating <laughs> the race. Yeah. So very, very good. Thank you for everyone who's watching. Um, like I said in the chat, if you just want to, uh, for anyone who's viewing, want to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, a fun fact, what Wake Up Narcolepsy event you attended this week for Sleep Awareness Week. Um, well, I attended too, I guess. I thought it was just uh, the narcolepsy nightcap with Trey Birds, but I also watch a race of yours on Tuesday. Um, yep. So I guess I got two events there. So um, with that, let's begin. So hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Q&A event and happy Sleep Awareness Week. Um, my name is Brian Mon, and I'm a volunteer with Wake Up Narcolepsy. I have narcolepsy type 1, uh, and that's with cataplexy. Joining us today is Vincent Arthur, and he is a iRacing eSports driver and a Carolina Pro late model series driver. Um, Vincent has partnered with Wake Up Narcolepsy uh, for the 2024 Nora Cup Series, so that's what I was referring to earlier when I watched a race of his. His car features a Wake Up Narcolepsy logo and colors to help raise awareness as he races. And we saw quite a bit of him at the last race. Today, we'll hear more about his experiences with narcolepsy, and we'll sh be sharing some of your related questions. So please feel free to um, share the questions in the chat. With that being said, welcome, Vincent. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really grateful to be here. When you're not race and I know we're we're keeping you busy so <laughs> so let's appreciate it if you can uh, kind of kick this off by telling us a little bit of your narcolepsy story like maybe what did your journey look like leading up to your, your diagnosis and when you were officially diagnosed stuff like that yeah absolutely so I first started noticing symptoms uh, of my narcolepsy back when I was a junior in high school so around four years ago um, you know, up before then, I was uh, experiencing some really bad anxiety. So I went to uh, my doctor and uh, got prescribed some antidepressants to try to uh, help with the anxiety. And that's kind of when everything started. Uh, that's when I really, you know, I just felt like I was in a constant dream state. I was, you know, able to fall asleep super easily. I'm not one who's usually able to like fall asleep in class, uh, but that started happening. Um, and that that's kind of when it kicked off the constant run around of, you know, try different medicines and try to figure out what it was. Um, and the brain fog was, was really, really bad. That's probably still like the main issue that I deal with to this day, but, um, nobody really knew what it was, uh, no matter what I said, no matter, you know, the symptoms that I was giving, uh, you know, it was really difficult for anybody to really put their finger on what it was. Um, so it was around January, or February of 2022. Um, I usually kick and jerk in my sleep, but it kind of got to the point where like I was almost awake and I'd punched the wall. And my mom has suggested, she's like, okay, you should probably get a sleep study uh, in case you have like restless leg, leg syndrome or one of these other sleep disorders that, you know, I just constantly move when I sleep. Um, so I went in and I did the sleep study uh, that went well. And then when I went to see the doctor a week later, he was like, you definitely have narcolepsy. And at this point, I had no idea what it was, but I was relieved that finally somebody knew what it was mm -hmm. and we could finally start treating it. Um, so then, you know, then I understood what was going on and what I was experiencing. Um, and, you know, then I could start surrounding myself with, or, you know, organizations like Wake Up Narcolepsy uh, and other resources trying to figure out how, to, how, to, how do I manage this better now that I know what it finally is. Yeah. And did you have a uh, diagnosed with type one or type two? Type two, so without cataplexy. Okay. And, and so how long was that period of time uh, when you first started seeing a doctor about it till when you were finally, when you were diagnosed with narcolepsy? Was it, was it a short period of time, a few years or? I went around four years, four um, years. of okay. experiencing symptoms before I was finally diagnosed. Yeah, as we kind of go through this conversation, those who have narcolepsy, uh, most of them already know, and those who don't, uh, it's all learning experience. 
Uh, we talk about different systems like kicking the legs or restless leg syndrome, uh, brain fog. So that's another one. Um, and, and so there are several of these symptoms, uh, comorbidities, things that happen. Um, so, and we talk about uh, sometimes there's a pretty big gap between when you first see a doctor about your issues. Um, a lot of people ADHD or something else. And then finally, maybe you'll get the correct diagnosis. So, you know, these things are all kind of related. It's it's kind of difficult, but and that's what we're trying to do is raise awareness, um, get not only people, doctors, everybody in the know about it, and just don't write things off right away. Um, so, what are some of the things that you do daily to help manage your system? Um, I try to keep a really uh, steady sleep schedule. Uh, it doesn't really matter what time I go to sleep. I try to make sure that I wake up around the same time every day. Um, just for me, it seems I function the best uh, on six to seven hours. Um, if I go a little under that, you know, then I start to drag during the end of the day. Um, but if I go more than that, then it takes me a while to actually wake up and become functional, um, uh, you know, in the mornings. Um, I do drink a fair amount of caffeine. Um, that's mm -hmm. just, you know. <laughs> That's just yeah. <laughs> to keep me up, keep me going, uh, you know, working and racing and just being around it. You know, the, the, there's very, very long days. Um, so caffeine can really help. So if there's any energy drink companies out there who would love to partner up, <laughs> yeah. you know, to reach me. I hear you. Oh, I don't have one with me, sir. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it's just one of those things. I'm not sure how much more it helps. Sometimes I think it's a psychological thing. Um, and, and, and if it can be just that then if that's helping me then then all the more for it um and, and are you currently in school yeah in college yes i'm i'm currently a junior at uh the university of north carolina at charlotte okay so we got student we got i racing we got actual physically on the track racing you're a busy man uh are you able to incorporate naps in there or does that help you at all yeah yeah, so one of the things that I've uh, kind of figured out works for me is I get really tired after I eat uh, usually. So I'll try to avoid eating a big meal like during the day. I'll try to eat a pretty big breakfast because at that point I'm waking up anyway. So my body really isn't affected by that. Uh, and, you know, then I'll eat dinner around like six or seven o'clock. Hopefully at that point, the day is winding down. Um, but during the day, if I do eat, like when I go to into work and whatnot, um, I'll eat and then I'll try to take like a 15 to 20 minute nap. Um, just at the end of it. And, and those naps usually help me, you know, really power through the afternoon and I can continue to, to continue to go through the evening um, being functional. I can I can go without it, but I find that the best days are the ones where I do have it. Yeah. For me personally, naps are sometimes tricky. It's one of those things I haven't done until just about five years ago. Doctor recommended it and I really needed it. Sometimes it works for me. Sometimes it don't. Sometimes I, I sleep too long. So that is one thing and that's again one of those things with narcolepsy you try different things medicines lifestyle changes try to incorporate that into your work and your school and it, it's a balance in that it's trying to find what works for you and then what works with your life with your family and stuff like that so um have you faced any stigmas when you're sharing your diagnosis and um do you feel like people are surprised when you uh, share your diagnosis? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when I, when I first tell people that I have narcolepsy, it's one of like three responses. It's so you just fall asleep all the time or you can drive with that or, you know, are you just like always tired? And, you know, it it's really been great to partner up with Wake Up Narcolepsy uh, and promote the awareness because a lot of people have been asking me, you know, what my symptoms are, what narcolepsy is. Um, there's just not a lot of educational stuff out there um, that's, you know, reaching the general public. Um, so being able to actually go out there and, and, and talk to people and tell them, you know, this is what I experience. It's different than everybody, but, you know, narcolepsy isn't, you know, just falling asleep or just being super tired or just not wanting to wake up in the morning. You know, mm -hmm. there's so much and it's, you know, so layered on top of it. So, um, yeah, there's, there's been a ton of stigmas, especially as a driver. Uh, I've had a couple of friends be like, I really worry about you when you're driving. And I'm like, you don't have to though, because, yeah. you know, I, I know what it is. I don't, I, you know, I'm, I don't have cataplexy. Um, you know, there's, 
I know how to manage my symptoms as best that I can, that you know, I'm going to be able to do what I need to do uh, the best that I can do it. Um, you know, and they don't have to worry about me. So it's being able to educate them. That's, you know, been the best part of this, but absolutely there's been stigmas that I faced. Yeah. Uh, uh, a while back, I wrote a little blog and, and one of the things, and it was, how can other people know about me when I myself don't know, uh, you know, what's wrong with me. And, and over time, not only are we trying to raise awareness for everyone else, but we're trying to understand ourselves and what works best for us. So driving is a big issue for a lot of people. And so for me, um, you know, nighttime driving is better for me versus daytime. Some people, it's the opposite. Long distance for me is way better than stuck in traffic and not going anywhere. So I can drive from Texas to Ohio straight, but I can't drive to Houston during rush hour. It's very difficult. So we all have something and we try, you know, what works best for me? I mean, when I drive to Ohio, I go every once a song. I, I do a little check. So every three to five minutes, am I okay to keep going? And I do that for 17 hours. So and if I need to pull over, I pull over. That's it. So I know myself. And, and sometimes it's just knowing you're able to do something. Like, say, accommodations. Uh, some places, workplaces have a nap room or whatever you need to do for a room. And, you know, for mothers and stuff. And so just the fact that they have that there well, doesn't mean I'm going to take a nap there all the time. But the fact that I know it's there. There sometimes it really helps me. So getting to know yourself is is a big thing because it's narcolepsy is very complicated. Absolutely. So as Absolutely. I mentioned in the intro, you're you're racing this year <clears throat> Nora Cup series with Wake Up Narcolepsy's logo and color. So like you said, that helps raise awareness as you race. And and watching your first race, even the the announcers uh, were saying we're looking at your cars like, does that say narcolepsy? Is, is he even a false? They even made a little comment about it. I don't know exactly what it was. Now, they didn't dwell on it or anything. But, you know, hopefully, uh, <laughs> as you get more attention, I'm really, and I didn't get to hear everything while you're racing, hopefully, you know, they even learned something and, again, raising awareness. Uh, you know, we got Wake Up Narcolepsy right alongside a Red Bull or <laughs> and the Frito Dorito dude out there, uh, Dorito Bandit. Uh, so that's great. I absolutely love it. So, um, and especially on Tuesday's race, you were in the top 10 or led for, for even most of the race. And then unfortunately got a little clipped at the end. So, uh, you definitely gave up wake up narcolepsy, some quality airtime with the viewers. So how did you get into racing and the iRacing esports? Yeah, we, we had a lot <laughs> of speed on Tuesday and that one. Man, it seems like I could never finish the deal at that place. Uh, I led two thirds of both Phoenix races last year and, and, you know, just had very similar luck, very similar luck, uh, both times and, and what happened on Tuesday. So, but yeah, how I got into, uh, racing, I've, you know, I grew up a NASCAR fan. Um, you know, it was just kind of one of those things I was on Sundays. I had all the matchbox cars. Um, I really liked <laughs> the sport. Um, and then. In 2015, when Jeff Gordon decided uh, decided to retire, I was like, okay, this is his last year. This is the last time I'm going to get to watch like my childhood driver, you know, race. So I watched everything. I watched the pre-shows. I watched the race intensely, like to the point where like, you know, I had to listen to all the audio and I'd rewatch it. Uh, and then I'd watch all the post stuff and the stuff during the week. Uh, and I just really dove headfirst into it. Um, and I always played the video games growing up, but when I heard about William Byron, uh, who started on iRacing, and then at this point he was in, I think, the Xfinity Series, which is like the the JV level of of NASCAR. Um, I was like, I I want to give that a try. So mm -hmm. I talked to my parents about it, um, and I had I had a little, little steering wheel that I used for my PlayStation, um, and then. You know, I was like, I can use this for iRacing. And my parents were like, okay. So they got me, a, I think, a three-month subscription um, for Christmas one year. They didn't know what it was. I really didn't know what it was, to be honest. But, you know, I got into it that way. And then um, I had some computer troubles. I got a new computer. I got myself a new wheel. And then I really dove headfirst into it. Um, and that's kind of when, and like, nobody really understood what I was doing. I think my mom could even attest to that if you asked her about it. And then, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, 
Did, did, yeah, so I, did your parents, um, were you, um, oh, I mean, your parents knew as soon as you found out that you had narcolepsy, were they with you or they were, they knew about it all along? Yeah. So I had given them a call, uh, when like they had, my mom had suggested that I go get my sleep study done. And then I had, uh, the sleep study done. And when I got the results, my mom was the first person I called and, and we were able to figure all that out because she's a nurse. So she kind of understood, um, what was going on there. But, um, Back to the whole racing stuff. Uh, I started, you know, doing the eye racing stuff and, and climbing, you know, the the ranks on there. Um, and that's where I really spent most of my time. Um, and then during COVID, COVID was the best, mm-hmm. worst time of my life because it gave me hours upon people. hours. Yeah, to just sit down, race, build setups, uh, you know, really progress my career there. Um, and then... When I moved down, I moved down to Charlotte in 2021. And at this point, I had very little real life experience. I was pretty established on the sim side of things. I had gotten to a really high level there. Um, But in real life, like my biggest accolade was setting the track record at the local go kart track. But Mm -hmm. you know, that's rental carts and that, you know, nobody really takes that for start somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, got to start somewhere. So then I got down to Charlotte. and my dad had actually met the CFO of Ray and Brothers Racing at the gym one day. Um, and he had given me his number, so I gave him a call. Um, and I got an internship with Ray and Brothers Racing, where I'm currently the race engineer of the number 22 truck in the Craftsman Truck Series. Um, and when I got that opportunity, um, I had, you know, told them my sim racing background uh and you know just being around racing they kind of understood what it was and understood that the level that i was able to get to that was pretty impressive for what i was able to do um so my boss josh rayum he's you know absolutely wonderful uh he's given me opportunities to race shifter carts and um you know we would go to the track every other week and, and just race and learn and have fun um and then we had a late model uh a carolina pro late model that was here you know, he gave me the opportunity to race that. And that's really what opened up uh, the doors to to the stuff that I'm able to do later this season. Um, And, you know, what I'm looking to do for the future. So if it wasn't for him, um, you know, I probably wouldn't be, you know, a Carolina pro late model driver, but um, you know, that's kind of how I got into racing and sim racing. And I still do sim racing now, obviously, but I'm looking to try to make that transition into real life as well. Yeah, well, let's see. Uh, engineering degree, I, I believe. Uh, so get some mechanics of the the vehicles. Got the cars. Got the trucks. You got the asphalt. You got the virtual track. Uh, you cover it all. So uh, yeah, uh, you know, you're doing a lot um, for yourself and for others. So I uh, really appreciate. It. So one of the things, and like I said, it's a balancing act with everything. As a student. Um, did you um, have any accommodations uh, at, at school to try to help you with anything, in, in, like in college, or was that was, was your diagnosis maybe a little too late for that? I think it might have been a little too late, um, but I look at the accommodations and I don't necessarily think any of them would have suited me very well. Um, you know, obviously the engineering degree, it's, it's super slammed on, you know, taken 18 credits just to graduate on time so it's uh yeah it's it's four years of absolute (laughs) you know chaos but um i don't think any of the extra time accommodations would have worked or anything else like that i had a couple i had extra time and then i had a computer accommodation in high school um where i was able to type essays instead of writing them okay um but i think the extra time I never really used it. And the reason with that is I would always second guess myself and then get stuff wrong. Yeah. So I realized the first time through when I was still fresh and I was still, you know, putting down what I was learning uh, and, you know, what I knew that was probably my best attempt uh, throughout the test. And then I would go back and I would check, you know, a couple little things, but I wouldn't try to make big swings on anything um, because I would oftentimes second guess myself because short term memory was really, really bad. Uh, and yeah. I wasn't quite able to remember what was correct and what was wrong. Um, so if I trusted my gut oftentimes more or more times than not, um, that was going to be the best way to go about it. So being a, a public figure as you are, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, I was diagnosed late after college. My wife brought me to the doctor, dragged me, and I would have probably never been diagnosed, or at least not for a long time if it weren't for her. 
Um, and you need that support system around your family uh, and supporters. Um, and, and so when you're in school, accommodations, I mean, you, you're at, some people need it and they're a little bit more out about it and, you know, get advocated for it. When you get into the work environment, sometimes it's a little bit more trickier, you know, whether or not to reveal that or not. Being that you're a student and you're involved in it now and you're a public figure, I mean, it's out, it's out. I mean, same for me. Um, and so hopefully that's a good thing. I mean, like you said, with COVID, there's the good and the bad. The good being maybe some employers realize that accommodations like working remotely is not as <laughs> bad as it, it sounded to them five, six years ago. So, um, but raising awareness again, doing what you're doing um, is just absolutely great. Um, during these races, whether or not it's on the track or virtually, uh, were there any challenges with your symptoms? Any symptoms um, occurred while you're there or you prepared yourself, you're in the moment, you're okay? I think for the, those events? yeah, so I think, I think for the most part, when it comes to sim stuff, it's a little harder um, just because when I'm in the real car, I have more senses to rely off of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm physically feeling what's happening. Um, it's strenuous. It's honestly a workout. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly oh, yeah. up you know, an alert and the adrenaline and you can't really, you can't really, um, understand what the speed looks like until you actually go that fast. Um, yeah. so, you know, you're constantly going processing information. So it's harder for the symptoms to kick in there. Um, but during this in the sim, I really only have to rely on my hands and a couple of vibrations from my pedals. So, um, and depending on my frame rate of my monitors and stuff like that, um, you know, the, the horizon can shift at a different, at a different rate. So it's definitely harder to do in the sim, but I put in a lot of prep work beforehand. Um, because if I do have, you know, the symptoms that, that kick up and I don't have as much capacity to process information, um, and to just get stuff out there, my baseline on what I'm able to fall back to in terms of like an aut automatic behavior, you know, that's still at the level of performance that mm -hmm. I need to be able to be competitive uh, perform the best that I can. Uh, and then I can use whatever brain capacity that I have, you know, I can use that elsewhere to think of how to make this pass or, or pitch strategy or, or, or something else. Um, you know, something else that's going to benefit my race. That's not on the performance side. Uh, and so you truly, uh, balance narcolepsy and focusing at that high level that you need in order to do something that you're doing, like, like with the race and there's so many details. Uh, speed things just going on very quickly. Uh, the physical forces of it. I mean, even mentally, physically, psychologically, um, it, it's all hitting you. And, and, you know, sometimes, so for me, it's the same way. When I'm in the moment, I can just go, 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 go. Um, sometimes the difficulty is when it's not that way. Um, so, like, say, with studying in, in school, how, how did you manage that? Did you have to shift your habits at all? Um, you know, for me, you know, it's going to kind of look a little funny, but I got a hoodie and I put it on and that helps me focus. So when, when I'm working, I actually have my hoodie on because I need to focus. And that's my strategy to get me in the moment when it might be a little bit more difficult. Do you have any strategies when you're studying and, and what works best for you? I try to take advantage of my medicine's working window as best that I can. So, you know, I wake up relatively early in the morning and i get going you know i try to be I, nine o'clock is probably the latest that i'll wake up um but if i can get out of the house or just get in an environment where there's something going on it keeps me from nodding off if i'm studying alone in my room um oftentimes that's a little more difficult when it comes to studying if i'm just knocking out assignments or just checking boxes like that's easier to do in my room um you know but if i'm actually having to like put down work and study and focus uh you know i'll go to the library or i'll sit um you know I'll sit in my dining room and my roommates are constantly coming in and out so there's you know always some sort of stimulation mm. um and then i'll have either piano or edm or, or something that's keeping my attention uh just enough that i'm not focusing on it but it's you know it's keeping me there yeah i, I think we all kind of have those strategies to help us you know for me uh noise would helps me on the one hand to keep me awake the environment but on the other hand it's maybe a little bit harder to concentrate with that but so, so again 
whether or not you're, you're trying to sleep or trying to stay awake during the day. I mean, we deal with this all day long, not only just trying to, you know, with the excessive daytime sleepiness, but uh, sometimes you can have insomnia and have trouble sleeping, restless legs or other things. So it's, a, you know, something that occurs 24 hours a day for us. So before I started watching your race, uh, NOR races on YouTube uh, a few weeks back, I thought iRacing was essentially just another video game, you know, played by console or PC gamers. My son actually showed me some of your equipment, which was just, you know, I assumed absolutely wrong. So now I'm, I'm much more aware of the time, the dedication, knowledge, and the resources that are needed for that unique niche in the gaming world. So same goes with nar narcolepsy. It's a, it's a rare lifelong disease. There's a lot, lot less fun to live with, honestly, than the, the racing. Incorrect assumptions are made. You know, people just see it. And, and like me, unfortunately, with your racing, I made an assumption. So what is something that you wish everybody knew about narcolepsy that maybe they wouldn't make that assumption it's not what you think and i know that sounds uh you know self-explanatory um or just like surface level but i mean i truly mean it it you know it comes in different forms for everybody um but it's never what you expect it to be sure there's some aspects of it that you know you could have thought about like if, if somebody has cataplexy um, you know, and they just, they're going and then they just fall asleep like that, that does happen, but there's so much more to it that, you know, people don't understand. So ask questions, um, really try to educate yourself about what it is. Um, you know, even as a person with narcolepsy, I'm still trying to educate myself on everything that there is and, uh, you know, where the medicine's at or what the best treatments are. Um, you know, I'm still doing that and I'm sure you are as well. So. Um, I think for everybody else, you know, if you just ask questions and try to get, you know, other people's perspectives, that's probably, that's probably the biggest way that you'll actually learn a, a well-rounded view of what narcolepsy is. Yeah. And, and that's kind of one of the things, um, we got lots of different things, you know, lifestyle changes for me, that's the most difficult part, routines and stuff. Some people are very good at it. That is my downfall. Uh, the medicines, uh, support groups like wake up narcolepsy support groups. So, you know, for 40 some years, whatever, I felt alone. I didn't know anybody with narcolepsy. And here it is, now there's a community out there. I get to learn, you know, share sometimes it's emotional support, but again, there's so much out there. And, you know, it's just what actually works for us, you know, strategies and stuff like that. But you know, the wake up narcolepsy support groups have been one of my best medicines. That's been one of the things that has helped me the most in the past couple of years, because I know I can always reach out to someone and they're there. So, you know, there are a lot of tools that we use um, to live our lives with narcolepsy. One last question, then we'll get to some chat. If you have the time, you got some time? Here? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So uh, what advice would you give to someone in getting their diagnosis with their diagnosis? I mean, for me, it would, sometimes it takes persistence, patience and persistence. Uh, what about for you? What, what advice do you got with the diagnosis? I echo a very similar sentiment. Um, it's really just, you know, constantly tell people what you're feeling. Um, you know, if you, if you say it enough, eventually there will be somebody who understands what you're going through. Um, or if, you know, you're going to a bunch of different doctors trying to figure out what it is, eventually there will be a doctor uh, who will understand and be like, okay, this might be narcolepsy. Let's get you a sleep study. So just constantly, constantly reach out, constantly talk to people. Um, just try to figure out, you know, try, try to figure out any way you can uh, to figure out what's going on because you're not alone. You know, there's, there's so many of us out here and I had actually never met another person with narcolepsy until I talked to Alejandro, you know, a couple mm. months ago. So Good man. that was a, re that was a really moving experience for me just to know okay there's somebody out there that knows mm -hmm. what i'm going through um and you know the more and more i get involved with the wake up narcolepsy you know the more and more people reach out and it's it's honestly it's been amazing it has been really amazing to see how strong this community is so if you're struggling with narcolepsy or think you might have it um you know reach out we're we're here and we're we're here to listen to you and we're here to share our stories um you know and we're here to help really 
Yeah, you know, there are so many great stories out there. And for me personally, I, I think uh, people with narcolepsy, myself not included, but are very creative, very good at what they're doing, you know, whether artistically, um, you know, we got uh, people that are working out that are big and strong. Um, and there are artists, there are people who do poetry, there are people who share their story, uh, articles or blogs or podcasts, you at the racing there's a lot of obstacles to get around to have keep doing the things that not only that we have to in order to live uh, and work for our families and support them, but just to live an enjoyable life and do the things that uh, we really like to do. So, yeah, uh, it's uh, I think just phenomenal that you being a student and, and doing the racing and uh, fantastic <laughs> um so you know and, and that's a that's a good thing um and, and you kind of brought this point up as well as uh the real trey holloway also brought it up and says man it feels so good to not be alone in this and and that's so absolutely true like, like i said I, I felt alone for so long and, you know, and, and for me, it made, it was a little different, especially early on, um, having an identical twin that does not have narcolepsy. So for most of my life, it was what's wrong with, with me? You know, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an identical twin. How come he can wake up in the mornings and I can't? How come he can do this? You know, we each have our issues individually. But, you know, for me as a kid, that was just comparing right away to oh, I should be identical what is wrong with me and, and so just being able to share stories and, and hear people um, share their experiences is just absolutely fantastic uh, let me see if I can uh, grab some questions um, do, do you take uh, any medications that you want to mention that you, you've taken or do take now I mean yeah. I try, <laughs> I've lived it with this for a while I, I've tried a lot uh, and sometimes I need to go back to something I've used in, uh, before. Maybe it loses uh, efficacy and I use it again. Some people can be on the same medication for a long time. So, again, very individual. Yeah. So, I mean, I've tried a couple different things. It was I was kind of being prescribed ADHD medicine, um, you know, for the longest time because that's, you know, just, you know, that's what they thought it was. But once I got, uh, once I got diagnosed with narcolepsy uh my doctor had started me on journey um and then i just continued taking vivance uh you know during the days um so the combination of them two it, it seemed to it seems to work um there have been days where i, I feel like you know i'm good and then you know there'll be a time time where i'm without my medicine for a day and i truly have no idea how i ever lived like that mm -hmm. um you know, because there's yeah. there's there's bad days when I'm on my medicine, and then there's just a day without it, and it's it's truly night and day. Um, so I, you know, constantly that's it's just something that I need to need to do, which is part of my habit. But yeah, are, are there certain things um, spoke of comorbidities or symptoms and stuff like that? One that sticks out that you. you <laughs> Uh, we don't like all these things, but that bothers you more than others. For me, once upon a time, it was the brain fog, which really affected my life. Um, now, maybe the restless legs <laughs> really bothers me. And so is, is there something for you that also kind of sticks out like that? It's really the brain fog. Um, you know, it's made it, it's caused a lot of social anxiety. Um, you know, growing up, I, I was kind of the person who could talk to anybody. Um, it didn't matter. You know, if you were my age, if you were, you know, my parents' age, like it didn't matter. I could really have a conversation with anybody. And then, um, you know, I was pretty like thoughtful. Uh, I, I made a lot of music. And then once my symptoms kicked in, it was really hard, really hard to say what I was meaning to say. It was if I got into an argument, it would get really difficult for me to I would lose my point very quickly mm -hmm. so I often lost arguments so then I would avoid a confrontation which ended up just avoiding people in general um, and it caused me to be super quiet because I don't want to you know I don't want to look 
you know, dumb or, mm. you know, look like I'm not paying attention or I'm not interested in what somebody's saying. Cause I am, I just, you know, I can't correlate it. It's up here but it's really hard for me to get it out. So the brain fog is definitely, uh, you know, what I fight with the most um, and just communication and, and stuff like that. So if there's something that comes up, I try to write it down super fast before I lose it. Cause I know it'll come and go as quick as it, you know, yeah. <laughs> as quick as anything else. I understand that. Um, and, and that's one of those things, you know, with, with brain fog, you know, with me, it, sometimes it comes a safety issue I and mean, you can't drive with brain fog. You got to make decisions. And, and you mentioned automatic behavior earlier. Well, sometimes it does go to that. And, and remarkably, our, our bodies and minds can do things that we couldn't have imagined. We don't even think about, obviously. Um, so, you know, so hopefully going back to maybe the employer's accommodations, uh, just for those who don't have narcolepsy, that maybe know someone or works with someone. Uh, one of my mantras was just open hearts, open minds. You know, we all, all as, especially as we get older, have issues, you know, and we really should try to un be understanding, um, empathetic, and, you know, accommodating. I mean, we don't ask for a lot, I don't think. Some people have it worse than others, some people need more. Uh, than others, but you know what? We we all want to do our very best, and I think that comes out a lot. Um, you know, uh, um, so even for uh, a couple of people in the chat, kind of mentioned cataplexy, and you don't have the cataplexy, and, but you you mentioned uh, you know maybe not doing some things because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, for me, the same way. I mean, I, if if I don't make myself do something i may not attend at certain events or further my career like you uh you know doing things outside the box you know going racing real life cars and trucks on the track you know reaching out to do something that, like that that's a that's huge um but you know we we have our strategies our tools i know when i go somewhere every exit <laughs> so if i need to walk out now i can control my cataplexy some people cannot so it's not easy you know, I, I, I remain emotionless, um, but we all have strategies, whether or not you're racing in school, or doing all those things, uh, lots of tools that we, we have. Uh, let me see if there's any other comments as I'm going through. Yeah, just to, quick. just to add on to that, like you said, you know, going out and, you know, trying to race in real life. One of the biggest aspects of motorsports is partners and sponsorships racing is a really really expensive sport yeah um and so like me personally the narcolepsy has made it really difficult to start those connections with sponsors to be able to you know get the funding to go out onto the track um you know and, and, and to get these races because i myself like i believe in what i'm able to do on track i know that once i get in that car um <clears throat> you know i'm going to be able to you know drive to the best of my my ability and, and get the best finish possible. Um, but being able to pitch that to somebody, um, you know, to put their logo on a car or just, you know, to help me further my racing career, that's really difficult for me to do. Um, so when I reached out to wake up narcolepsy, um, <clears throat> and we were able to start this partnership, you know, it was really, it was really meaningful to me that I was finally able to, to partner up with a company to be able to promote awareness, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the goal is to get wake up narcolepsy on, on a real life, you know, car at some point. So yeah. I think if, if we can do that, you know, the Q and A is great. Instagram is great. But when we get out on the track, I mean, we're bringing that to, to the thousands and thousands of people. So oh, yeah. that's, that's, that's cool. really what my end goal is with there. Yeah. yeah. I'm all for it. <laughs> um, someone in the, in the chat, cat, cat can internet, uh, says I use a Fitbit to track my sleep and pre-sleep medicine, I would wake up a ton at night. Do you use a Fitbit or any devices? I know some people utilize their phone to track stuff or Fitbits. Um, so I, I have an Apple Watch that I wear all day. I let it charge during night, uh, during the night. Um, but what I've been able to realize is I can tell when my symptoms are kicking in by my heart rate. So my heart rate sits at around like 75 is around my resting. Um, on my medicine, but I can tell when my symptoms start to kick in, my heart rate will start dropping to like 60. 
like 55, just around there. And that's around my heart rate when I'm sleeping. So, you know, th then I can kind of get an early tell, okay, I probably get up, move around, do some push-ups, do something to, to try to get the blood move and try to get the heart rate back up a little bit. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I'm able to track it. But in terms of actually going to bed and, and tracking my sleep, um, I haven't, I haven't really done too much of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, uh, you've shared a lot today and, and I absolutely thank you. And any final thoughts, uh, before we, we go, uh, offline here pretty soon. No, I'm just really thankful thankful for the opportunity. Uh, I'm really grateful that, you know, wake up narcolepsy, you know, that we have been, I'm really grateful to them uh, for allowing me to, to partner with them and uh, to bring, you know, awareness about what narcolepsy is uh, to the public. And, um, you know, every Tuesday night, I'll be out there racing. Uh, you know, if we, we get some deals to go to go real life racing here later in the season, we're looking at a couple of races in July, hopefully, um, you know, we'll be posting all about it and we'll, we'll try to get some people out to the racetrack and, and, uh, you know, bring that, bring that to the public in, in a, in a very significant way. So yeah. every Tuesday, keep watching. We're about to switch up the schemes a little bit, hopefully. So and, and we'll you be out there and definitely make colors. it exciting. I mean, like I said, you're in the, the top group pole position at the uh, one race. I think you're next to pole, uh, more recently, always in the top group. So, we we get to see a lot of your car in the wake of narcolepsy logo. It's just absolutely fantastic. So uh, thank you everyone in the chat for asking questions. I apologize if I didn't uh, see your question. Um, I, I'm sure we can sit here all day and I wish we could uh, with Vincent. So thanks again, uh, Vincent, for uh, for joining us today and for everyone for tuning in during this Sleep Awareness Week. Um, and so on behalf of Wake Up Narcolepsy, uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to all the 2024 awareness sponsors for making this event possible. Um, and, you know, support uh, Vincent, Vincent in his endeavors because um, definitely want to raise awareness offline, on, online, everywhere. And, and the more we can get that, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So. Um, we can get that on this uh, sponsorships and knowledge sharing. That That is absolutely great. So thanks again, Vincent, and everybody out there. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.